I wonder, as you look around the church at large, and I'm talking about the church as a whole, the visible church, the people who name the name of Jesus, the people who talk about knowing Him, loving Him, worshipping, serving Him. If we look around, do we, do we get much evidence that the church really wants God? Does the church of Jesus Christ really want Him to turn up and have His way in us? We pray about it. We talk about it. We sing about it. But do we really want it? Is it something that we desire? Is it something that we're longing for? Is it something that we are seeking for? I can't help but as I look around the church... feeling that often our services, often our programs, often our ways of doing things seem to be more of a substitute for God's presence than seeking God's presence itself. Because everything that we seem to do seems to get us further and further away from what the Bible describes as knowing God's presence. And in that way, I think we resemble the exiles in Babylon. Because the church is in a foreign land, isn't it? The church of Jesus Christ is among enemies. It's It's an alien in this world. And the one thing that we do need is God's presence. And yet, that is not necessarily what we're all looking for. The exiles in Babylon were like that. They were far from home, far from Jerusalem, far from their family, far from their friends. Many of them had been there nearly 20 years. But there was little evidence that they wanted God himself. There was little evidence they wanted God to come and to speak to them. They didn't really want to encounter him. They just wanted to go back home. And I think this is seen as we bring Ezekiel chapter 3 to an end and enter into chapters 4 and 5. Because in these chapters we have about nine prophecies from Ezekiel. Nine separate prophecies that all talk about Jerusalem. That all speak to the people about what Jerusalem really is and what is going to happen in Jerusalem. (coughs) If we go begin in Ezekiel chapter 3, we find there the first of Ezekiel's enacted prophecies. And it's an interesting one because Ezekiel, the man who is called by God, he has encountered God in this miraculous way on at least two occasions in the early chapters. He is tasked with being the watchman for Israel. He is to call out danger. He is to bring God's word and tell them where the danger is. And we hear in Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 22 forward that he is to be silent. He is to go into his house and he is to shut the door. He is bound with cords and his tongue is to cleave to the roof of his mouth. In other words, he is not to go out to the people. He is not to speak to the people. He is not to encounter the people. It's not an interesting way to be a watchman. We can imagine a watchman in a tower. We can't imagine a watchman in the tower who cannot leave. Or who cannot shout danger. Who cannot raise the alarm. But that's where Ezekiel finds himself. And we can debate about the literal nature of all these things that are happening to Ezekiel. The the point is that Ezekiel is being demonstrated to be under the complete control of God. He is under God's authority. And we, we are told here that God is going to tell him when to speak, when to emerge, and what to say. The whole point of this initial prophecy is to remind the people or to tell the people that when Ezekiel comes out of his house in the morning, you do need to take note of what he does. When Ezekiel opens his mouth, you need to take note of what he says because God has told him to do it. Because God is at work in him and they, the exiles, needed to pay attention whenever he stepped out and stepped into their lives. And that's exactly what happens because God does tell him to go out. Now, 
we're going to read some of the prophecies that Ezekiel makes. And some of them are long. I think one of them lasts 390 days and then 40 days. And there is debate over what is happening here. Some people think that this is his condition the whole time. 24 hours a day for 380 days, he's lying on his side in the dirt with making this prophecy. Um, I think that's a bit difficult, especially given that God gives him other things to do during those days. It seems most likely that at certain times in the day, Ezekiel will emerge from the house and he will enact these prophecies. He will do the things that God tells him to do and the people will see. And he will do it for 380 days and then 40 days. But the point is, the message is being told to them again and again and again. And they're being called to take note and to watch and to learn what it is that God says to them. But the first thing we have to note is the very fact that God has given Ezekiel these messages is a marker that there is something going on in the hearts of the exiles. There's some thought going on here. There's some desire in their hearts that is leading them and directing the way that they're thinking and the way they're living in Babylon. And I want to suggest to you that thought is that there is a desire for them in them for Jerusalem. They are longing for Jerusalem. They are hoping that one day they will return to Jerusalem. Maybe some are making plans of how they will escape from Babylon and go back to Jerusalem. There may be some who are just mourning its loss and just hoping that things are better with their people who are left behind in Jerusalem. That everything that they are is bound up in the thoughts they have about Jerusalem and they're hoping and praying and thinking that someday they will be back there again. But I want to read, I want to begin by reading Ezekiel 5, verses 5 to 8, because this is what God says about Jerusalem, and it's not encouraging. It's not encouraging. It says this, Thus says the Lord God, This is Jerusalem. I have set her in the center of the nations with countries all around her, And she has rebelled against my rules by doing wickedness more than the nations and against my statutes more than the countries all around her. For they have rejected my rules and have not walked in my statutes. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you are more turbulent than the nations that are all around you and have not walked in my statutes or obeyed my rules and have not even acted according to the rules of the nations that are all around you, therefore, thus says the Lord God, God, behold, I, even I, am against you. Friends, do you hear what God is saying about Jerusalem? He's saying this is the state of Jerusalem. This is the state of the city from which I have brought you. This is what you have done in that city. He says, I have set you among all the other nations, and you are more wicked than them. That you have rejected my rules and my statutes. That you are more immoral than the pagan nations that are around you. Instead of being better, you were supposed to be a beacon. You were supposed to be the light on the hill. You were supposed to be the example of what it means to follow God. And instead you are worse than all of the other nations that surround you. And here we see into the heart of the people, into the heart of the exiles that uh, Ezekiel is speaking to. They want to go back. But they don't want to go back to God because what did we notice happened in the first three chapters? God came to Babylon, didn't he? God arrived. God came in his great chariot throne into the place where they were. God with his entourage of spiritual, amazing cherubim who came with him. They, he came to where they were and they want to go back to where they sinned and to where they rejected God, and to where they rebelled against God, and where they were an example for wickedness. Do you see the people that Ezekiel has been called to speak to? They bear the name of God in a foreign land. God has come to meet with them, to encounter them. And where is their heart? Where wickedness dwells. Back in Jerusalem. And these prophecies are going to 
destroy every thought they have about Jerusalem, every hope they have about Jerusalem. These prophecies that Ezekiel is going to give in these two chapters is going to tell them there is no way back. Friends, the first thing we notice is that Jerusalem is not a place of peace. It's a place of war, a place of conflict. It says this in Ezekiel 4, 1 to 8, And you, son of man, take a brick and lay it before you and engrave on it a city, even Jerusalem. And put siege works up against it, and build a siege wall against it, and cast up a mound against it. Set camps also against it, and plant battering rams against it all around. And you, take an iron griddle, and place it as an iron wall between you and the city, and set your face toward it, and let it be in a state of siege, and press the siege against it. This is a sign for the house of Israel. Then lie on your left side. And place the punishment of the house of Israel upon it. For the number of the days that you lie on it, you shall bear their punishment. For I sign to you a number of days, 390 days, equal to the number of the years of their punishment. So long shall you bear the punishment of the house of Israel. And when you have completed these, you shall lie down a second time, but on your right side, and bear the punishment of the house of Judah. Forty days I assign to you, a day for each year. And you shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem with your arm bared, and you shall prophesy against the city. And behold, I will place cords upon you, so that you cannot turn from one side to the other till you have completed the days of the siege. Friends, can you imagine? The exiles, some of the exiles are going to Ezekiel's house to see what's happening today. And for 390 days, and then another 40 days, they're going to see Ezekiel come from his house. And he's going to set a brick on the ground, a brick in which the city of Jerusalem is engraved. And like a child playing with toys, he's going to set up siege works and battering rams and all sorts of models to show this city under attack by its, by its enemies all around. And then he's going to place a griddle. It seems like it's some sort of... Uh, uh, symbol for an ineffectual defense. He's going to set it between uh, himself or himself and the city. And then he's going to lie on the ground as if he is God with his face against that great city. Friends, is, could the message be any clearer? Could the message be any more sure? What Ezekiel is enacting is the fact that God's face is against his people, against that city, Jerusalem, and that the enemies that surround him, uh, surround it, are doing his will. That it's their, his judgment that is coming against the city of Jerusalem. Now, this isn't happening right at that moment. It will happen a few years from here, whenever Nebuchadnezzar goes back. It is something that is yet future whenever Ezekiel brings the prophecy. But the idea is there, and the idea is sure. God is against Jerusalem. God is against Jerusalem. They may be having struggles in Babylon. Maybe it's tough being an exile. We know it's tough being a stranger in a strange place, especially when you don't want to be there. Things may be difficult. There may be conflict with the locals. They may be spat on in the streets. They may be despised. They may be hated in various sections. Maybe the elevation of some, like Daniel, has uh, created animosity between them and the, locals, uh, the local people. We don't know. But what we do know is that there's war in Jerusalem. That to any, have any thought of hope in Jerusalem is to waste your hope. Because there's nothing, only death there. It talks about other things that we don't really understand. We don't know if it's talking just about Judah or it's talking about Israel, the northern tribe and the southern tribes. We don't know what the 390 years and the 40 years actually means. There's huge debate and nobody can get the math to work out right. We don't really get it. But we know the siege is there. And we know that, God, that Ezekiel exemplifies God's anger against his people and his, his, his setting of his face against his city and the fact that it will not be moved, it will not be changed, that his wrath is absolutely sure. The watchman 
speaking on God's behalf, exemplifying God's attitude to his holy city, says there is no peace in Jerusalem. There is only war. That Jerusalem isn't your hope. The Babylon is a place where God has set you. Friends, he not only says there's not only war, or there's no peace, only war, but there's hunger, not plenty. There's hunger, not plenty. Verses 9 to 17, it says, And you take wheat and barley and beans and lentils, millet and emer, and put them into a single vessel and make your bread from them. During the number of days that you lie on your side, 390 days you shall eat it, and your food that you shall eat by weight, 20 shekels a day from day to day you shall eat of it. And the water you shall drink by measure of the sixth part of the behin. From day to day you shall drink it, and you shall eat it as barley cake, begging it in, the, in, their, on, in their sight on human dung. And the Lord said, Thus shall the people of Israel eat their un- bread unclean among the nations where I will drive them. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I have never defiled myself from my youth up till now. I have never eaten what died of itself or what was torn by beasts or has tainted meat come into my mouth. Then he said to me, See, I assign to you cow's dung instead of human dung, on which you may prepare your bread. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, behold, I will break the supply of bread in Jerusalem. They shall eat bread by weight and with anxiety, and they shall drink water by measure and in dismay. I will do this that they may lack bread and water and look at one another in dismay and rot away because of their punishment. Friends, the people who gathered at Ezekiel's house, they will see him lying on his side with his face against Jerusalem. A model, a model war going on before them. And then they will see him eat a meal. And what a pitiful meal it will be. Mixed grains. Mixed grains. They only mixed the grains whenever, whenever trouble came. The grains were mixed in times of war so that they can have a little that would go a little bit further. How much food was he to make? 20 shekels of a barley loaf. 200 grams. Four slices of Warburton's medium for a day. Can you imagine? That wouldn't do me for my breakfast. A sixth part of a hen of water. Half a liter. The point of what they're seeing, they're seeing... Ezekiel, eat out a living and eat this tiny, teeny meal so that they will know there is no plenty in Jerusalem. And what's worse, he has to bake it on human dung and then there's a concession made because of Ezekiel's protest as a priest that he's never eaten anything unclean and so he's given uh, animal dung. But the point is clear. When does the people of Israel cook on human dung? It's when all the animals are dead. It's when there's no meat. It's when there's no livestock left. It's when they've all been exhausted and all they have is the dregs. Friends, the whole point in this is there's poverty and there's hunger in Jerusalem. It's a place of loss and emptiness and want that will never be satisfied. Friends, as they gather outside Ezekiel's house, the only thing they're going to see is that Jerusalem is a wasteland. Things might be tough in Babylon. Maybe they're hungry in Babylon. Maybe it's tough to get food. Maybe some people won't sell to them. Maybe they don't have enough money to buy all the things that they had when they were back in Jerusalem. Maybe they remember fondly all the joyous festivals and feasts that they had in Jerusalem. Maybe those joyous festivals and feasts that were to pagan gods and to all sorts of vile deities that God called them to reject. But they remember what they had. They're like the Israelites when they were called out of Egypt. You remember? And they got annoyed in the desert and they said, Oh, we remember the plenty that we had when we were slaves in Egypt. It's the same idea. Maybe they thought things were going to get better. Maybe they longed for Jerusalem to have their bellies filled, to have the food they liked, to have the things that suited their palate, to have it enough that their children would have enough to eat. But the watchman, as he baked his little loaf on some cow dung and gathered us half a liter of water and then ate it before them in misery, That told them 
that Jerusalem was not what they thought it was. It wasn't the great hope that they hoped it would be. Friend, in Jerusalem, there was death, not life. There was death, not life. Ezekiel 5, 1 to 4, and it says, And you, O son of man, take a sharp sword, use it as a barber's razor, and pass it over your head and your beard. Then take the balances for weighing and dividing the hair. A third part you shall burn with fire in the midst of the city, when the days of the siege are completed. And a third part you shall take and strike with the sword all around the city. And a third part you shall scatter to the wind. And I will sheath the sword after them. And you shall take from these a small number and bind them in the skirts of your robe. And of these again you shall take some and cast them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. From there a fire will come out into all the house of Israel. We know this is going to be a less frequent prophecy because he has to shave his head with a sword and his beard. But the point is, it's a shame. And it's a violent act that's done with a sword. This wasn't what was usual. So it was exemplifying something that was done against Israel. And it was exemplifying something that was a great shame to Israel. And as his hair is taken and it's weighed, a third is burned in the fire. Friends, a third of that city is going to die. A third of Jerusalem is going to die in the city. then another third is going to be ruined by the sword. Exemplifying the fact that another third of the people are going to be killed in the siege. They're going to be eradicated as they run. And a third are going to escape. But they are going to be pursued by the enemy with his drawn sword. Friends, do you see what's happening in Jerusalem? Jerusalem's a place of death. Jerusalem's a place where death is coming, and death has come. They were hoping to get away from Babylon, this foreign place, in order to live life, but what they were longing for was a place of death. And friends, what do we read? Only a remnant survived. Only a remnant of this her was put into the watchman's garment. And even some of that was burned. But only a little remnant left. A little remnant of Abraham's people, of David's people, of Solomon's people. Only a little remnant of his descendants to carry on the work, because we know what the work is. Romans told us, didn't it? That the work was to bring Messiah into the world, and it was always planned to do through a remnant, and God will keep a remnant alive. They will be in the the hem of his garment. As signified by Ezekiel's little bunch of hair from his beard and his head tucked in there safely. Friends, there was no hope in Jerusalem. There was no life in Jerusalem. Life was to be in the remnant, wasn't it? Life was to be one of the hers that was saved. One of the herbs or the hers that had, were taken by, the, by God and kept where they needed to be, friends. That's where hope was. And yet the people wanted to go back to the place of death. The people who claimed to know God, the people who were the people of Judah, wanted to go back to the place of death. They didn't want to be among the remnant. Friends, these prophecies, these prophecies about Jerusalem are a stumbling block that God is placing before his people in Babylon. They have a choice to make, haven't they? What are they going to do? Are they going to long for this city? This city where there is war and famine and death? Or are they going to come back to God? Are they going to come back and put their trust in God and follow his ways in Babylon where he has placed them? Friends, the sad thing is that we know is that most of them will continue their longing for Jerusalem. They're longing for sin. They're longing for wickedness, even though it brings forth death and war and famine. They were not longing for God at all. Friends, we bring it down to ourselves. We bring it down to the church at large today. Could it be 
that our visible church is longing for something other than the coming of the Lord, the presence of God in their lives, the, the faithfulness to God, that relationship with God that we talk so much about. It seems to me that the church is more interested in reliving the old days, those good old days that we used to have. You remember? Well, probably before we were born. There was a time when the church was uh, popular, at least by today's standards. There was a time when people came to, their, came to church in their droves every Sunday. And how many in the church of Jesus Christ would love to see that again? And I'm not talking about loving to see it so that they would come and be saved, but just to see them filled, just to have the, this idea that we are popular, that we are full, that people take notice of what we do. It seems to me that many churches are interested in that. How many of the visible church today are interested in the power that the church one had? Remember when the church ruled the way, ruled nations? Whenever we told kings what to do, whenever the, the great and holy men of the church were in control, it seems to me there's many people in the church today who would love those days again to tell politicians what to do, to give advice to the people who make the big decisions, to at least be respected. Do you think there are many people in today who are looking back to the times when the church was successful, when it had money and power and influence and all of the things that success brings, and they think, well, we would love to get back to the place where the church was in there in that moment, friends? It seems to be that many people in the church are longing for those things, but not longing for God, not longing for closeness to Him, not longing for likeness of Him, but for the trappings, the trappings of power and success. And that is why we do the things that we do. Is it? Or am I, I might be being hypercritical. But is that why we have music that wouldn't be out of place in a nightclub? Is that why we have activity that we could find in any other sphere of life and suddenly it becomes the center of what the church is? Whether that's... Uh, whatever sort of work that you can think that that is, counseling and all sorts of good things that are good in and of themselves, but not what we're here to do. Could it be why from the pulpit we have people who are, who are giving out so many great ideas, but very little of the Word of God? Friends, it seems to me that the church is willing to sacrifice holiness so that we may become popular among the vilest of people. Truth, so that we don't have to worry about the heretic. We're willing to sacrifice Christ again so that we can worship anything and anyone who does it for us. And that's why the church is at war with itself. So many in the church and so many parts of the church were in conflict because we're falling over ourselves to embrace wickedness, denying what Scripture tells us. I read of another denomination this week who's denying the reality of hell, rejecting forgiveness through Christ's shed blood in favor of some idea of inclusion. Is that why we're in a famine for hearing the Word of God? You know, we have lots of places that we can hear the Word of God today, but there's so much bad stuff going on. So much bad teaching, so much philosophy wrapped up in religious ideas, inspirational talks that are wrapped up with the name of Jesus in some way, but nothing to do with the Bible at all. Our church wants to celebrate sin rather than holiness and rejoices in wickedness instead of goodness. Friends, is that the church that we live in today? Is that the church at large out there? Is that the church we see? Friends, I think as a little church, as we bring it down to ourselves this morning, because I hope hope and pray that none of these things will be said about us. But we are like the exiles. We have a stumbling block in our path today. 
a stumbling block in our path every day because we have a choice to make, because we can make the mistake of going down the same road as so many other churches are going. Or are we going to follow the remnant who are walking with Christ? Or are we following the remnant who are walking His way, seeking His presence and seeking to be like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Friends, there's so many, many out there who think God's only interested in answering our questions, making us feel good, making sure that we are the people that we want to be. But friends, D.A. Carson says this, God is less interested in answering our questions than in other things. God is interested in securing our allegiance. This is the stumbling block. Allegiance to Christ or allegiance to the world. We'd have to make our decision as individuals and as a church, which way are we going to go? Establishing our faith. This is the way we are going to go. Are we going to go the way of the world? Or are we going to go the way that Christ is leading us? Nurturing a desire for holiness. Are we going to go back to the good old days? Or are we going to pursue God on into holiness? Into being better than, he has ever, than we've ever been able to be before? Friends, Jerusalem, in this passage, is a place of sin and wickedness. It's not where we want to be. Friends, it's better to be in Babylon with God than be in Jerusalem with the devil. And friends, today we are in East Ayrshire. And we are in East Ayrshire and we're surrounded by those who don't love the gospel, who still need to hear, who we still want to see turn to the truth of Christ. What are we to do? Are we longing for some far off plan that was once in our imagination, that we thought it once was? Or are we content to be here where God has placed us? Where God has come to be with us. To enable us to live for Him and for His glory among the people He has placed us among friends. That is my prayer for us today. That we will find contentedness. Knowing Christ. Walking with Christ. Loving Christ. Following Christ. Not looking for what we think is a good idea. What we think it was once like. Or what we hoped it would be but simply that we will follow Jesus and that we will determine in our hearts never, never to deviate from the path that He has set for us and the path that He called us to in the power of His Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we know the temptation to go our own way. We know the temptation to to look for the good old days again. We knew that the temptation to try and relive what we once knew or thought we knew. Father, we thank you that you, that you are with us here right at this moment. Like you were with the exiles in Babylon. Let us heed the voice of the watchman. The voice of Christ as it comes into our lives right at this very moment. And he calls us, follow me. Walk with me. Be with me. Because no matter where Christ is, we'll be heaven and home. Amen. Amen.